I'm Tzachi Cohen Carney. I'm an associate professor of biomedical engineering and material science engineering. I will tell you today about bioelectronics with nanocarbons or forming input output interfaces with excitable cell and tissue using nanocarbons. Input output. You have uh, the biological entities such as a uh, neuron or cardiomyocyte. They're soft and squishy. They communicate via uh, fluxes of ions or signaling molecules that elicit uh, fluxes of ion response. Uh, they form networks in situ, spheroids, organoid, and organs. The solid state end of the uh, uh, interface, such as this uh, handful of allotropes of carbons, we uh, can control their optical electrical properties. We know that they communicate via electrons or holes. Uh, we can form them uh, or attain them via, uh, via different synthetic routes. We can modify their surfaces using different chemistries toward and uh, downstream, let's say, uh, applications. IO from my end is the ability to sense electrical and chemical activity of electroactive cells, cellular assemblies and tissues, or a ability to modulate cellular or tissue activity, either electrically or chemically. Before we delve deep into this topic, let me tell you about the Cohen Carney Lab. We are trying to push the limits of the current platform to enable a long-term investigation and modulation of cellular electrical activity with high spatial and temporal resolution. We are also developing new types of hybrid nanomaterials for both energy storage and conversion and, and, and biosensing. A, a few examples you can see over here uh, are basically uh, three-dimensional biosensing platforms that we develop to record uh, uh, the electrophysiology of human-based uh, spheroids and organoids. Bioelectronics that is as small as an axon using new types of materials that the, the lab is developing and of course the uh, materials that can be used to modulate the electrophysiology of neurons and hopefully in the future myocytes and materials that can be used for uh, sensing and uh, energy related research first let me thank my outstanding team whatever you'll see in the next few slides is the outcome of their really hard work the first topic of today is three-dimensional engineered tissues and actually the lack of tools to form I.O. with them. Uh, so how come three-dimensional uh, tissues uh, uh, are, are important? So there is uh, extensive literature that indicate that cells cultured in 3D exhibit in vivo-like phenomena, such as neurite extension uh, that is extended essentially uh, in 3D versus 2D. The cell shapes do represent in vivo-like uh, topology uh, rather than flat and, and spread out as they are on a surface. The, uh, uh, the cells that are cultured in three, three dimensions have lower mortality and basically have a higher neurons to astrocyte ra ratio. And cells that are cultured in three dimensions uh, have elevated synapses uh, formed. This is just a, a brain-like tissue. You will find similar uh, results when it comes to muscle, cardiac, and different types of tissues that are, cu are cultured in two dimensions versus three dimensions. If you're interested in more information, feel free to contact me and I will refer you to the uh, relevant papers. Here is our concept of the organ on a chip. This is basically uh, an organ on electronic chip. So we call it organ on e-chip. We are going to create a three-dimensional sensor array that is pinned to a surface and upon removal of a sacrificial layer marked by this red rectangle, it will self-roll in into a three-dimensional entity, as you can see over here. We can assemble different types of sensors, such as an active sensors, as field effect transistors based on graphene or microelectrodes based on metallic electrodes coated with conductive polymers such as P.PSS. The biggest advantage of our approach is that we shrink wrap sensors around the tissue and monitor the electrophysiology of the tissue from all uh, sides of the circumference of this tissue essentially. Where when you have a, an organ on a chip the only the apex of this organ will be interfaced with the bioelectronics and you have no prior knowledge of the state of a cell that is 
away from the electrode essentially. So you're getting information from subsets of cells uh, that are in contact with the sensors, unlike our approach that records from three dimensions. As a proof of concept, we use the three-dimensional assembled microelectrode arrays to record from uh, human uh, cardiac spheroids, so embryonic stem cells derived cardiomyocytes uh, uh, spheroids. So we mount a single spheroid into our three-dimensional biosensor array, and we recorded uh, 12 sensors concurrently. This is a, a calcium uh, movie showing the electrical activity using optical imaging. You can see that the optical imaging gives us a single plane of, uh, of activity. However, our sensors give a three-dimensional uh, information of the electrophysiology. Here are 12 sensors and calcium uh, signal that was recorded in between uh, the channels over here. And basically, from a single sensor level, you can learn all about all the uh, ion transient or ionic current transients, such as potassium, calcium, and uh, sodium. Uh, this is uh, 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 an average of 100 bits, so 100 peaks from channel 4. Uh, uh, and the, the red is the average, the gray is uh, overlay of all the 100 peaks. While acquiring a single channel and learning about single device level is interesting, the more interesting is extracting information from the array of sensors. This is what we've done over here. This is actually a two-dimensional or two-dimensional projection of a, a three-dimensional isochronal map that we created. The details are given in, in our manuscript if you are interested. What's unique about this platform is that it can be applied to other uh, uh, organs. In this case, we interfaced uh, the self-rolled biosensor array with the uh, uh, cortical spheroids, and we actually applied the whole pipeline of data acquisition and analysis, including drug screening, in this case, uh, glutamate, um, a neurotransmitter, a, a stimulant essentially, and showed uh, basically that one can uh, affect and record at the same time. So what you'll see over here in this uh, calcium imaging, uh, essentially an increase in the firing rate right uh, uh, now basically, as you can see. Uh, and again, one can do single unit analysis and then firing rate analysis uh, uh, compare it and correlate it basically to calcium imaging. Uh, this is really a unique uh, uh, opportunity uh, to fuse this new tool set for future su studies of tissue development, disease progression, drug testing and screening uh, in a human tissue. Uh, I'm listing this uh, uh, work that was published uh, around the same time we published our paper out of uh, uh, John Rogers lab, again, another idea how to fuse bioelectronics with, uh, 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 with assembloid of cortical, uh, cortical spheroids in this case. Uh, in the last several years, we reported our unique technique to generate these nano pie brush like structures of uh, out of plane grown uh, single to fueler graphene flakes uh, from a template of uh, silicon nanowire. Uh, basically, you have a surface of two by two centimeters that is covered by, by these uh, fuzzy wires. You can see them all over the place. Here is a zoom in on a single wire, and you can see this fuzziness of single to fuller graphene. Uh, if you're interested, you're more than welcome to go to these papers and other papers we published on this type of material. I'm not going to cover the whole spectrum of devices or bioelectrical devices for neuronal uh, modulation. They're extensively used in uh, tremor control, depression, and pain control as well. What I want to show you is a different way to modulate the electrical activity. This is again from the input end uh, using light. So first technique is optogenetics, basically expressing ion channel that is sensitive to light. And as you can see, you can modulate the electrophysiology of neurons 
uh, using pulses of blue uh, light in this case. Biggest drawback uh, or challenge in this uh, type of technique is the, the need for a genet a genetic modifications of the organism. The other techniques are uh, basically infrared laser pulses that can alter the membrane capacitance, and I will speak about it in a couple more slides. Uh, essentially, the barrier of this approach is the uh, low spatial resolution and the uh, high uh, input energy that is needed. In the last few years, there is a surge of interest in using nanomaterials or material science-based uh, approaches uh, to modulate uh, neuronal or cellular activity, not just neurons, but cardiomyocytes as well, or muscle cells as well. This is using uh, either photothermal or photoelectrical effect. Uh, however, these type of materials, uh, though outstanding achievements were done or shown, uh, are limited in their wavelength, uh, limited in their absorption and photothermal conversion efficiency, and limited in material stability. Here is our approach for a remote non-genetic optical modulation of electrophysiology. Uh, basically, we are generating this library of optically uh, uh, tunable materials or optically active materials by controlling the properties of the core made out of silicon nanowires and a shell made out of graphene flakes. As you can see, we can control the density, size, and chemistry of these flakes. We'll use a single wire attached to, uh, in this case, a dorsal root ganglia, shine pulses of laser, and modulate the electrophysiology of these cells. These are the structures that we generated in the lab. You can see that we can change the density and size of the flakes by modulating the time uh, of the process or the temperature of the process as well. Unlike singular graphene, uh, our materials are uh, uh, basically opaque, close to black in color. So you can see a 90 minutes growth time will generate a uh, close to 97% uh, uh, absorbance, uh, quite the opposite of singular graphene. If you shine pulses of laser on these materials, you will generate this uh, temperature increase due to energy con uh, conservation. Uh, and we can actually generate up to seven kelvins with 10 milliwatts of laser pulses. The bare silicon nanowire will barely increase in a basically less than half kelvin uh, temperature change. If I'll summarize all this, uh, what you see over here is fuzzy wires, including a uh, Maxine. Maxine paper will come out soon in ACS Nano, so I won't show much data about this one. Here is how we modulate the DRG electrophysiology uh, using NT3DFG. Basically, what you see over here is DRG with NT3DFG attached to the membrane. We patch the cell using glass capillary. This is the ground truth measurement. And as we uh, fix the uh, uh, pulse duration and increase the pulse power, you can see that gradually you get close to the threshold. And then you have this all and on phenomenon that is the action potential. The whole process is uh, due to the optocapacitive effect. Basically, a uh, rapid temperature change uh, will change the cell membrane, which will result in a transient current. And once this transient current hit the threshold, you'll have this all and on behavior, the action potential. As a proof of, of this uh, idea, we held the membrane potential in uh, uh, high values, as in negative minus 150 millivolts, and shine uh, the laser, and you can see these transient currents, essentially. Uh, if you compare our materials, basically NT3DFG and Maxine, again, this will be published in the next few weeks, you can see that our uh, needed energy to get an effect is a lot lower than the uh, uh, rest of the materials that are being used. This is highly reproducible stimulation when you use NT3DFG. This is just 15 consecutive pulses with the ground truth of electrical stimulation and photothermal followed up, uh, up afterwards. We can drive a neuron in different frequencies, 1 hertz, 10 hertz, and 20 hertz, as you can see over here. As a teaser, we use now Maxine Flakes, which is actually better than uh, fuzzy graphene when it comes to a uh, film. Uh, and you'll see more of these coming up in the next few weeks uh, in ACS Nano. Another unique aspect of uh, out-of-plane grown uh, graphene uh, is the fact that we can generate these microelectrodes and now use the, these microelectrodes with the known optical properties of this material to optoperate cells. Using ultra-fast uh, pulses of laser, we were able to demonstrate a transition from extracellular field potentials to intracellular field potentials and also perform uh, uh, multiple patches up to nine cells at the same time. It takes few seconds to do it rather than many, many hours using a patch clamp system and of course execute drug assays, as you can see.
I would like to thank my group, my collaborators and funding agencies. Thank you for listening.